This is a Puritan and Reformed audio book podcast. This chapter is taken from the book called Spiritual Refining, An Anatomy of True and False Conversions by Anthony Burgess, 1652. The difficulty and in some sense impossibility of salvation, notwithstanding the easiness which men fancy to themselves of it. When the disciples heard this, they were astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? Matthew 19, verse 25. Having in a number of instances discovered the weakness of those props which most lean on in reference to salvation, I shall conclude this matter with a discourse upon the disciples' pathetical exclamation in the text, Who then can be saved? In the verse preceding, we have mentioned made of one who had good wishes and desires for heaven, but being put by our Savior upon an exploratory duty, it proved like jealousy water to him, discovering his rottenness. He was a spurious brood of the eagle, for he was not able to endure these pure sunbeams. He went away sorrowful, for he had many possessions. It does not say, for he loved them, but he had them. It being very difficult to have these things and not immoderately love them. They possessed him rather than he possessed them. He had much wealth, as we say. A man has a fever when that has him, destroying and wasting his health. Upon this we have our Savior uttering a strange and paradoxical speech to flesh and blood. Christ's words were miracles as well as his works. It is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Compare this with Mark 10, and there are several aggravations first. Our Savior says, it is hard. Mark says, he spake it with admiration. How hard is it? This then he affirms with a vehement asseveration. Verily, yea, Mark says, he looked about him to signify he had some extraordinary thing to say and therefore would have them attentive. Yea, the evangelist says, he sighed also. When he spake this further, he spake this to his disciples, though not rich, as appears by that compilation in Mark. Son, how hard is it, and so on. As a tender father, he bids them beware. In the next place, Christ does not only show the difficulty, but at last the impossibility by a proverbial speech. It is as impossible for a rich man to be saved as a camel to go through the eye of a needle. A proverb in the eastern parts to express an impossibility. Those that would understand it of a cable rope as a mistake about the Greek word so they consider not the greater impossibility is implied in the phrase, the more significant it is. Now the speech of our Savior is in hard speech, but you are not to expostulate or contend with God's ministers about it. For truth itself has said it. Only by rich men, Mark expounds those who trust in them. But Matthew speaks it absolutely because of the difficulty not to trust in them when we have them. Upon the speech of our Savior, we see a notable operation on the disciples expressed first in our outward disposition and then in their speech. In their disposition, they were stricken with amazement. It was with them as if they had some astonishing blow given them. And then you have their admiration. Well, who then can be saved? This implies that they thought before they heard this it was very possible, if not an easy thing to be saved, but now they despair of it. But why do they say, who then can be saved in the general, and not rather, what rich man? For of them our Savior spake, such poor men as the disciples might be saved for all this. It is answered thus, though all men are not rich, Yet all men have a desire and appetite after riches, and so they are by this stopped in their course to heaven. Or thus, though all men are not rich, yet as rich men have their wealth, which they immoderately rely on, so there is no man but he has some creature or other, 
he does inordinately affect. And that makes him a camel with too big a bunch to go in the straight way to heaven. Did howsoever men may suggest to themselves many probable and easy grounds for their salvation, yet upon scripture consideration it will appear a great difficulty, yea, in some sense an impossibility. Thus the disciples which they happily attended only to Christ, his gracious invitations and manifold promises of his love, they thought it a very easy manner to get to heaven. They found nothing but honey come out of his mouth. Now when they hear our Savior speak of the exact qualification of him who shall be saved, they are affected with fear as the Israelites were, who thought it impossible to possess Canaan because of the tall Anakims that must first be conquered. For the clearing of the doctrine, let these three things be premised first. That when we say it is such a difficult and impossible thing to be saved, we do not relate to that natural impossibility which is in every man. For so, not only rich men, but even infants newborn, it is as impossible for them to be saved as a camel to go through the eye of a needle. For seeing all are by nature dead in sin. We can no more put spiritual life in ourselves than Adam could at first have made himself of a lump of earth, a living soul. We do not then fetch this impossibility upon the impotency and inability of a man in respect of original defilement, though this stream will by long windings at last empty itself into that fountain, but upon the curious bounds that grace prescribes our affections, even to lawful things, so that although we may love and desire and use these creature comforts, Yet if we go but one step beyond those limits, we have presently transgressed. And so when our Savior says upon this to comfort the disciples with some hopes, with God all things are possible. Though it be universally true, yet it is more peculiarly to be limited to the matter in hand. God can level his camel's bunch. He can command the waters of our affections to stand still and not to overflow. Secondly, this, therefore, may be extended not only to a natural man in his unregenerate state, but even to a regenerate person, so that we may cry out what godly man can be saved. The work of grace is so exact. Temptations are so great. Corruptions are so strong that we may say, Who of the godly can be saved? For though God's grace will give them to persevere, as Christ's presence in the ship did, or might assure them they could not perish. Yet when they saw their danger and were in tempests and storms, they cried out, Master, save us, we perish. So even a godly man, though while he looked to the covenant of grace, he may anchor his soul securely, yet at the same time beholding his temptations and infirmities, he may frequently cry out, O Lord, support me, I am falling into hell. We will therefore suppose a man in a state of grace, yet were it not that with God all things are possible, this godly man would make shipwreck of his soul a thousand times over, ere he could get into that glorious haven. So Peter in 1 Peter 4.18, The righteous is scarcely saved, which though it be principally meant of temporal deliverance, Yet spiritual salvation is by necessary consequence included. Thirdly, although this be true, yet it must be acknowledged that if we do respect the grace of Christ in his fullness, it is a very easy thing to be saved. For let sin abound in the guilt and power of it, yet grace in the justifying and sanctifying effects of it does much more abound. Hence God's mercy and pardoning is compared to the heavens, and our sins are but like the earth. Isaiah 55, 9, or as a drop of water to the sunbeams, which is quickly dried up. In a fifth of the Romans, you have an excellent opposition between the second and first Adam, showing how much more potent Christ is to save and grace to give life than Adam was to destroy and send a curse and condemn in which respect Christ is said to give life, and that more abundantly. Now this is to be marked by the dejected, tempted heart, which seldom looks up to grace, but to all the difficulties that are in heaven's way. 
They cry out, oh, never godly, never believing, never coming up to scripture principles. But they do not join God's power in their infirmity, God's grace and their guilt together. They do not say, O oh Lord, because this is impossible to me, is it also to thee? Because I have sinned away my own grace, have I also sinned away Christ's fullness? Therefore mind is strict qualifications to make thee walk humbly in fear and trembling. Mind the gracious fullness of God's love and power to make you full of hope and comfort. Put the camel's bunch and God's power together. These things promise, let us consider, what are those considerations that make salvation so easy to a man's natural thoughts? The first is, a representation of God altogether pitiful and merciful, without taking any notice of his purity and his justice, that he is a God who will not acquit the guilty. This half-representation of God to a man's heart makes him thus confident. Men argue, how can we thank God who says he would not the death of a sinner? Who says, why will you die, O house of Israel? Who has put pity into men's hearts? Shall not much more be a fountain when streams are so plentiful? This has been aggravated so much that it has been an opinion of some that at last all men, yea, and devils also shall be saved. But the scripture speaks of God's sting as well as his honey, of his fury as well as his pity. The scripture speaks of his rejoicing in the destruction of the wicked, as well as pitying them. Do not you therefore deceive your own soul, by minding God's mercy merrily. God's justice is to find out those who have abused mercy, and he is a fire to consume as well as to give light. A second ground which makes salvation so easy is a general offer and tender of God's grace by his word, and which none seem to be exempted. Now if to this be added a doctrinal opinion also, which does abound in these days, namely universal grace and universal redemption, they now publicly persuade themselves the way to heaven is a broad way. But this doctrine does quite overthrow the doctrine of a particular election of some only to salvation, which yet the scripture manifestly declares, and it puts a whole discriminating event of a man's self from others into the hands of free will. For if Judas have as much of the grace of God, and as much by the death of Christ as Peter, the only reason why Peter does repent and Judas does not is merely because the one improves his power well and the other does not. Therefore, although general tenders of grace are enough to encourage those that are hungry and thirsty after it, and such as are burdened by sin, yet they lay no foundation at all for such a universality of grace as they pretend to. Neither do we lay a foundation of despair in this. For we say this grace does truly belong to everyone that believes and repents, and they are many and cannot go further. He dare not say this grace belongs to you whether you believe or not, repent or not, so that we are as universal in pouring of oil into wounded souls as they are. Thirdly, salvation is thought to be easy because of a mistake about faith. Oh, say they, if a man do but believe, then heaven is his. Christ is his. As to him that believes not, condemnation belongs. Now all natural men think it is a very easy thing to believe. What, to trust in Christ with all thy heart? How ready is every unregenerate man to say, he does it. And upon this it is that the papist charge us as making it such an easy, pleasing way to go to heaven. It is but believing, say they, and then all is well. But all this is a mistake about faith. He that says faith is easy never knew what it is to believe. To presume is easy. To be secure and self-flattering is easy. But out of the true sense of sin and deep humiliation for it, to rely on God's grace, this the godly heart finds not to be done without many conflicts and spiritual agonies. Faith, therefore, is made the work of God's Spirit. And it is that which the devil does most oppose, because that does most withstand him. Lastly, therefore men make it easy to go to heaven. They may seek that in the last place, live in all jollity, and then to cry, Lord, have mercy on me at the last gasp is enough. 
because they wholly mistake what true godliness and repentance is. What godliness is, they understand not. They think not of being born again, of the pangs and travail the soul commonly is in before it is thus formed. They don't consider the way to heaven as a straight way, and few that enter therein. If they did, could they be so silly as to think such vicious lives as they live, such formality and morality they continue in, were the way to heaven? Certainly, if this be so, then the scripture speaks false. Straight is the way, Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. No, broad is the way, larger the paths, and few miss them. You therefore think it is easy to be saved because you take copper for gold, counterfeits for pearls, and thus a man may think himself very poor. Again, they mistake about repentance, for they think all kind of sorrow for sin. Every Lord have mercy upon them, especially if this be with tears, a true repentance. But if this be so, we may cry out contrary to the disciples who will not be saved. Then blessed Ahab, godly Pharaoh, holy Judas, for all these more or less acknowledged their sin and begged for pardon. But if you examine scripture and see how much goes to godly sorrow, what principle it must come from, what motives must produce it, what effects flow from it, you will be amazed and say, O oh Lord, I doubt I never truly repented. My tears are too salt to come from a contrite heart in a gracious manner. Now do but observe all those men who are secure and confident about their salvation. You may as soon persuade them a black amour is white, as they begin to have the least doubt and suspicion about themselves. And you shall see it's one of these pillars they lean upon. If this their foundation were raised, all their hopes were gone. Could you drive them out of this refuge? Then you would cry out, Men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? Let us therefore in the next place consider why upon scripture grounds it will appear such an impossibility without God's wonderful grace. For a man, yea, a godly man to be saved, so that of all miracles it will be the greatest to see a godly man passing all the rocks here and safely lodged in heaven. And first it appears a wonder. If you consider that grace in a man's heart is not in its natural soil. It is like an herb transplanted and put into some ground it does not agree with. Now it is a wonder this herb of grace does not wither. Alas, a soil helps nothing to it. God gave commands at first to the earth to bring forth grass, but alas, our hearts cannot do so. Grace in our hearts is like a stranger in a strange land, like a spark of fire in the deep ocean like a candle in a boisterous, windy night. It's a wonder if it do not go out. And certainly if Adam so quickly lost his grace, when yet it was co-natural to him, his heart was a fit soil, were it not for the covenant of grace which fails not. A godly man would fall seven times a day, wholly from God, as well as the scriptures say he does so often in temporal calamities. Oh, then wonder how any grace comes to be alive in your heart, that those coals are not smothered up, that every night you do not, as that mother, lie upon your child, and through security and negligence kill this poor infant of grace. Number two, the impossibility of it appears in the several manifold works of God's grace, which are absolutely necessary after we are regenerate. So that suppose a man be converted, Yet if grace did not afterwards help, and that several ways this man would die in the wilderness and never get to Canaan, now God's grace is various. There is preventing grace in which a man is kept from those many sins and temptations, which if plunged into would utterly undo him. Thus David was kept from murdering Nabal, and as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, By the grace of God I am what I am. So he might have said, says Augustine, By the grace of God I am not what I am not. Ye divine say, Plura sunt gratia, privitiva, quam positiva. God's preventing miracles are more than his positive mercies. Oh, therefore think, if the grace of God did not keep off this sin, this lust, this temptation, 
How had it swallowed you up as a well did Jonah? Again, there is protecting grace, and that is, when you were in the midst of all temptations, yet grace defends you, and you sin not. We wonder at God's miraculous deliverance to Daniel, who was kept alive in the midst of roaring lions. Alas, God does no less of you every day. There are devils, like so many roaring lions, seeking to devour your soul, and it's grace that has a covering over you. It's a remarkable expression of the psalmist. Mercy does compass the godly, Psalm 32, verse 10. It's a court of guard against all those assaults that our spiritual enemies would make upon us. There is also quickening grace in which the principles of holiness are daily blown up and enlivened. Now, if this bellows were not always blowing, if this were not always filling our cells, we would lie like so many dry bones. This wind must arise ere they can come together. David found the necessity of this when he so often prayed that God would quicken him. Your very graces would lie and rust away, were there not this exciting grace. Do not the people of God fall into diverse lethargies and hurtful sleeps because of the lack of this? Again, there is cooperating grace which goes along with us to do as well as to purpose in our heart. It is God's grace that works in us not only to will but to do, Philippians 2, verse 13. When we have desires and affections to duties, how many times are we diverted and through laziness or distractions interrupted, but grace carries us out to the work itself. There is also corroborating grace in which the principles of holiness, being weak and unsteady, are confirmed and strengthened more and more. For grace, though it keeps us from sin, yet carries us on to holiness weakly and faintly. So he prayed, I believe, help my unbelief, Mark 9.24. Thus the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, that many times they do the things they would not, Galatians 5, verse 17. Paul calls this to be strong in the might of the Lord, and I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Paul has a kind of omnipotence, and to him all things are possible, because possible to grace which enables him. Lastly, there is a persevering grace. For let a man be furnished with all the former fruits of grace, yet if this of perseverance be not added, their works are not crowned. It's not of the essence of grace to continue always in the subject where it is, for then Adam and the angels could not have fallen. It is therefore a distinct work of grace to give perseverance from the first infusion of it. Number three, the impossibility of it is seen in those sly insinuating motions of lust that do still abide in the hearts of the most holy men. And so much that it is a wonder all the sweet fruit of your soul is not quite eaten up with these worms that breed in them. All godly men consumed by those motions and sparks of sin that are not yet extinct. James does excellently describe the subtle working of original corruption, James 1.14. It does entice a man away with a sweet or profitable bait hiding the hook, and it does draw the heart aside from considering all those arguments and motives that would make him forbear sin. Now that the spawn of sin, which would quickly prove serpents and cockatrices, is not destroyed, appears by Paul in Romans 7. How strong and unruly does he find those remainders of sin in him, that were it not for God's grace ready at hand to heal him, Paul's soul would quickly become as noisome through spiritual sores as Job's body through bodily ulcers. It's a wonder that every man is not a Cain, a Judas, considering what fuel there is in every man's heart. Number four. The impossibility of salvation without grace appears in the temptations that are in lawful things, insomuch that when outward gross sins could not damn, the immoderate love of lawful things has been like a millstone upon the neck to drown in perdition. When the Philistines could not undo Samson, a Delilah in his bosom can. Your wife, your children, your houses, your trade, these kill you by secret poison, whereas gross sins destroy by open sword. One of the ancients in a vision saw the world full of snares, and so it is. 
A shop is a snare. Wife, children are snares. Our Savior on purpose shows us in that parable. Where those invited to the feast say not, I am a drunkard, a swearer, and cannot or will not come, but I have bought, and I have married, and therefore cannot come. Luke fourteen twenty. Seeing then, everything we touch is like pitch. Everything we meddle in is ready to entangle us. Who can be godly, and so who can be saved? This wrought to an extremity upon some, the thought unless they gave over all worldly employments and spent their days in cells and caves with continual devotion, they could not be saved. But this was too much. 5. This will further be clear if you consider all the enmity, subtlety, and power of the devil against a man, especially if godly. In Ephesians 6, it is with principalities and dignities in high places, and Satan has desired to winnow you. He chooses out the godly in a more special way to undo them, Luke 22, verse 31. There is two things in sifting or winnowing. The one is concussion and tumbling of the corn and chaff, or refuse together. The other is a separation of the good from the bad. Now the devil desired the first only, to mingle grace and corruption, to bring them all into a confusion, and so overcome them. Now did not Christ powerfully intercede, our faith would quickly fail in such extremities. That same parable of a man going to Jericho and meeting with thieves was miserably wounded, being left half dead. If it may be applied to a man's spiritual state, is not meant him before conversion or in his natural state, for he is wholly dead but after his conversion many times foiled by Satan, and therefore needs oil and balm continually. Number 6. The impossibility of it appears in the manifold duties and ordinances which God has appointed us to be frequent in, all which suppose a fire would quickly go out. He has appointed frequent preaching, administration of sacraments, daily prayer. And why is all this? that these warm clothes and continual rubbing of you may keep life in you. God knew how fading our graces were. Hence he has commanded this continual dropping and watering, else your soul of a paradise would quickly become a barren wilderness. And to this head may we bring those continual afflictions and chastisements which God does most exercise his children with. And why are these? But is so much soap to refine us, so much fire to get out dross. They are like the beating of the garments to get out the dust and moths. Now then, if there should not be such a continual praying, preaching, purifying, who could be saved? What godly man would not become like a standing pool full of mud and filth, so that salvation is a prize hardly obtained? Number seven. The impossibility appears in that there is a requisite a presence of all graces, and proportionable cooperation of them. Now without God, how impossible is this? Add to your faith, temperance, and so on. Second Peter 1 verse 6 If any one of these be lacking, it is a monster, not the image of God. And so many have come near godliness, been very like it, but have proved apes only, not really good, as there must be a presence so a cooperation also. The scripture commands the putting forth of such graces that to mere nature are inconsistent. They never act one, but they prejudice the other. Thus we are come with bold assurance to the throne of grace, and yet we must in holy fear and trembling. So we must have repentance and faith, godly sorrow and godly joy together. We must have prudence and zeal accompanying one another. Now who is godly if these things be so? Number 8. This will appear in the miscarriages of so many, who have put fear for heaven and yet fall short. Oh, if grace and salvation had been an easy heaven, men could easily have got into it. Why have so many suffered shipwreck in the haven's mouth? What was Judas? What was Jehu? What the foolish virgins, what the second and third kind of hearers, 
Did they not do much and suffer much, and yet at last prove blazing comets sending in slime, not fixed stars? Oh, methinks you should all stand and tremble to see them wallowing in their soul's blood as they did at Isabel, in his body's blood. Number 6. The strict and accurate endeavors of the godly argue, they concluded on this principle, that it was difficult to get to heaven. I made a covenant with mine eyes, says Job, in Job 31, verse 1. I set a watch before my tongue, says David, in Psalm 141, verse 3. I keep down my body, says Paul, lest I become a reprobate, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Think of this and tremble, whose affections and thoughts on good things are by the by only. It's hard for the poor man to get wealth, for a languishing sick man to get health, but above all, for a man to get grace, and when he has it, to keep it. Chapter 15 of the book Spiritual Refining by Anthony Burgess